Good morning everyone and welcome back to the virtual international conference on global research trends in biotechnology hosted by the Department of Biotechnology from St Joseph's College of Engineering. It is my privilege to welcome our speaker for this evening Dr Venkatesh Endalur Gopanarayanan. He is a young yeast biologist with over 7 years of experience in genetic protein and metabolic engineering. He completed his BTech in St Joseph's College of Engineering. and is mtech from anna university majoring in biotechnology during this time he was an undergraduate research intern at the national institute of epidemiology at icmr in chennai he then went on to obtain his doctorate in biotechnology engineering from tufts university in medford with an astounding gpa of 3.97 on a scale of 4 while there He worked on constructing a yeast platform for catabolism and any non-narrative carbon Uh, source and engineered synthetic regulons in Saccharomyces cerevisiae for non-native substrate catabolism. He has also trained and mentored three undergraduate students at Tufts University. He is the recipient of various awards and fellowships, including GATE (MHRD Government of India) Graduate Scholarship in 2011, and the Shirley and Stanley Char- Charm Scholarship in Food and Biotechnology for both the summers of 2013 and 2014. He also received the graduate opening access funding in February of 2018. He is a family finalist in the Dell Social Innovation Competition conducted in March of 2011. He has published papers in leading journals such as Nature's Communications and Biotechnology and Bioengineering. Currently, Dr. Venkatesh is a scientist at LifeMind Therapeutics Incorporated and has been instrumental in engineering exotic fungi at this company. He has developed synthetic orthogonal expression systems for production of small molecules, designed and built multiple synthetic biology tools for engineering model and non-model filamentous fungi, and has also worked with a collaborative team of scientists and researchers on multiple projects. Sir, it is an immense pleasure to have you with us today. I request you to take over the session. Um. Yeah. So as I was saying, it's definitely. Uh, I'm definitely glad to be back, and especially giving a talk. Uh, at Saint Joseph College of Engineering, and without further ado, I would start my presentation. All right. Um. So this is one of the major chunk of work I did during my PhD. Um. For like four or five years, we were working on this project. Um. I personally felt it's a good project to speak to. and mostly undergrad audience um since i thought this as a synthetic biology field combines a lot of um topics and you know courses that as an undergrads and even postgrads uh, you know mtech students study um i felt this combines a lot of biochemistry genetic engineering reaction engineering uh, biochemical engineering basically like entirely diverse fields and brings them together and makes it into like a nice uh, research and also i thought this is a good way to show that you know what were we read during our undergrad and you know masters are not just because they are theory right they are theories that can be used to solve world problems actual practical world problems um so that's basically the reason why i'm here presenting this um topic um so i am i i am a uh, scientist at uh, lifeman therapeutic which is a biotechnology drug discovery company uh, in cambridge massachusetts usa um since a lot of the work that we do there are kind of uh, you know uh, confidential i can't reveal those um, but yes we do engineer a lot of different fungi and it's been like a very exciting journey for me over there um but what i can talk about is my phd research which also has the same flavor as what i currently do right now um before i talk about my research i um i'm sorry i'm trying to move my slides and okay sorry yeah now it's fine uh, i would like to actually acknowledge a lot of people who has helped me with my research and um especially the lab that i worked in during my phd um i would also like to point out the advisor is dr nikhil nayar he has been a huge help for me and without all the support of people who were there working in the lab this wouldn't have been possible 
um and finally um i was just speaking to one of my advisors one of the time and it seems that they have been like they're really sad that they don't get a lot of applications from india uh tufts university is um in boston and since it's a small research university it doesn't like to public publicize itself um and the rate of uh, acceptance is also like very low uh, but still it like it, it would like to see a lot of uh, applications coming from india especially from anna university uh, this has been personally communicated to me by the chair of the department of biochemical and biological engineering also and also by my advisor uh, so this is just a quick snapshot of you know how the university looks like how the labs look like uh, so if anyone is thinking of you know applying for higher education please go ahead and give it a try um um they are good university i know a lot of people don't even ha haven't even have heard the name uh, so i thought i'll just you know shamelessly publicize it for like a minute and then go on to the research part all right going on to the research part uh, i know this this involves a lot of words that uh, people are not you know uh, sure of uh, or you know haven't come across but basically what all these you know mumbo jumbo translates to is can we make yeast eat whatever that we wanted to eat um yeast are generally yeast not just any yeast but uh, the bakers yeast or saccharomyces cerevisiae are not you know non picky eaters they are kind of fastidious in what they eat uh and i would like to go ahead and translate and show you know why they are like they are um so the reason why this project i just like to give a little, little bit of motivation before i go forward right um so the main motivation is you know doing better metabolic engineering and as a field of metabolic engineering it has been there for almost like 3 to 4 decades and the idea behind that is basically you take uh, an organism and try to engineer it and engineering it in different ways and you know you make uh, chemicals or you know drugs uh fuels etc um so that it can be used in an industrial scale um so the whole idea of metabolic engineering can be broken down into basically you giving some kind of a carbon source and other nutrients for microbial cell factories and that gets converted to some kind of a product later uh so that's all metabolic engineering really is and the products basically can be you know anything from you know, industrial bulk chemicals fuels drugs like antimicrobials that i just talked about or even like fine chemicals that are like super expensive um and it also depends on what the feed you give it and it can vary anywhere from you know lignocellulosic biomass which is basically like you know the most abundant uh, biomaterial that there on earth uh, which in turn is composed of cellulose semicellulose which in turn has you know other monomer sugars in there it can it can also be you know you know other sugars like lactose single uh, carbon compounds like alcohols or aldehydes like methanol methane uh, except formaldehyde like that uh, you can also use carbon dioxide you know which would you know uh, result in a uh, absorption or you know retake of all the carbon dioxide that's out there in the atmosphere um and the products right that can be split into different uh, sections you have either your low profit margin products uh, like you know industrial bulk chemicals biofuels etc and you have your high profit margin products like you know antimicrobials or fine chemicals if you have your high profit margin margin products you basically don't have to worry about um why you what kind of sugar you put in uh you don't have to worry about the cost of the entire fermentation and the process itself um because you would be having a high enough profit margin that to cover you know even expensive sugars but in the case of the low profit margin ones then you need to really care what kind of sugar you put in uh so then the question kind of reverses on itself basically um so the idea question becomes what kind of sugar that is cheap enough can be used you know for metabolic engineering so that the entire process becomes viable and feasible um in that setting the cheapest one that you can think of is lignocellulose which is as i said uh basically wood particles that has been treated and 
as like you know a lot of other sugars in it and since it's the most abundant biomaterial on earth it's like easy to metabolize or sorry easy to find but not easy to metabolize very hard to metabolize actually uh, <clears throat> um yeah so i was as i was saying um lignose cellulose is uh, you know ideally the best uh, nutrients that we want to use um and um as it has multiple sugars whenever you want to you know metabolize lignose cellulose you want to make sure all the sugars that are there in the lignose cellulose mixture is also you know completely metabolized because you don't want to have like 30 to 40% of your um you know lignose cellulose mixture having sugars that are not metabolized to the end of your fermentation which is going to directly affect your you know um productivity downstream um and in our test case we wanted to see what people have been doing generally as since a lot of these sugars are not metabolized normally by most of the microbes uh there has been a separate field called uh, catabolic engineering where people try to engineer uh, these organisms so that they utilize these um low cost sugars really well uh so that is the field of catabolic engineering in essence in, <clears throat> in essence uh so how do we do that is that you take a sugar that is not normally metabolized which i'm going to call it as a non native sugar because that particular organism cannot no normally natively metabolize that sugar and you want to make it assimilated you know uh into its native pathways for any of the industrial microbes that we have and how do you do that is basically you start expressing enzymes that are not native to these organisms so that you convert this uh non native sugar into some kind of a native metabolite by going over any kind of non native intermediate that is there uh so once you get into a native metabolite that's there then it kind of feeds into any of the central carbon metabolism chain that's there like you know glycolysis pentose phosphate pathway uh pca cycle etc so once it feeds into that then you know the native metabolism takes over and then you start your you, you can get your product as well as you know biomass for growth um so but usually it, it whenever this process is whenever this process happens it's usually not that smooth uh, there's a lot of issues in there uh, we basically see a lot of thermodynamic limitations that's there uh, we see uh, limitations with enzyme kinetics uh, we see that the vmax or km of the enzyme for that particular non native sugar or the non native intermediate is not great especially because it's in a heterologous uh, you know system where the ph and temperature for the for that particular enzyme is different completely different from what is there for the native sugar native organism um so then you need to start engineering these particular steps uh, to deep basically start deep bottlenecking it or removing the rate limiting reactions that are there uh, but as we all know in metabolic engineering uh, you know this not just like one rate limiting reaction reaction as you remove one the other one pops up so you know you start to do it uh, iteratively um um and in an ideal case scenario you want the growth rate of uh your organism in this non native sugar to be as high as how it would be in like glucose or some kind of a sugar where it grows really well um um so people have been as i said people have been doing this um field for the past 30 40 years and instead of doing this iterative you know uh, process where you know you start engineering each and every um, enzyme that's there uh, for ideal performance and increase the growth rate what people tend to typically do is start um, uh, accumulating beneficial mutations in these organisms uh, by selecting it for growth in these non native sugars and this technique is usually uh, referred to as adaptive lab evolution or adaptive evolution and that's just like a crude way of saying you know i don't care what's going to happen inside the cell as long as it grows better in my particular native sugar that i want uh, so what i'm going to do is just start serially growing them again and again for like few weeks or few months until the growth rate of that particular uh, organism in this particular you know non native sugar is like really high um uh so when i started doing my phd i was really interested in this field of metabolic engineering and catabolic engineering especially because this uh, this 
particular field of catabolic engineering has been like really recalcitrant and you know, not easy to work with. Um, as you can see, you need to do like extensive engineering in this to even make sure one particular non-native sugar is being consumed. Um, and yes, there are examples of you know successful engineering in this field, uh, but it involves not you know uh, we just express a few enzymes and that's it. Voila, you're gonna get your final product. That has never been the case. Uh, it always has involved you know doing extensive rounds of uh, mutations, serial adaptive lab evolution, along with you know expressing these uh, pathways. Um, so in this case, I thought, you know, why is it so hard? Why is this problem so hard? It should be like easy for us to, you know, solve this. Um, so we thought, okay, let's, you know, uh, try doing something different for this project to see if we can, you know, solve it in a better way. And also another thing that we found uh, was quite shocking is in the past 20 years, there has been like no new tools or strategies, um, you know, that has been newly available in this field. So we wanted to address all these problems that are there. And as a test case, uh, we wanted to solve an issue that's the most uh, you know, studied problem in this field, uh, which is basically xylose metabolism in Saccharomyces cerevisiae. So we thought, you know, let's take this as a test case and work with it. And um, Saccharomyces cerevisiae or yeast, you know, is you know, um, a commonly used industrial workhorse. Um, <clears throat> And xylose is the second most abundant sugar in lignocellulose that I just talked about. Uh, so naturally, you know, people want to make sure that xylose is uh, utilized by yeast. And because of that, there's been almost like three decades of research in this field. Uh, but even after three decades of research, the fastest strain that, you know, has been designed rationally without using adaptive lab evolution only grows at a rate of 50% uh, of the growth rate as that of, you know, when you grow it in glucose. Uh, I think in glucose, the, um, uh, <clears throat> yeah, I think in glucose, the growth rate is somewhere around like 0.3 to 0.35 uh, per hour. And uh, in xylose, the maximum that was engineered was like 0.15 or 0.13. Uh, <clears throat> so, you know, this is not an ideal case scenario and we definitely would like to, you know, increase it. Um, so then how do people usually engineer it, right? Uh, so people can engineer it using, researchers have been engineering using two different pathways. Um, so I have those two different pathways here on either side. And the one on the left is basically referred to as an oxidoreductive pathway, as you can see here. Uh, xylose is being uh, reduced and then oxidized. So basically it goes from a sugar uh, aldehyde sugar xylose to an alcoholic sugar xylitol, and then you convert it back to a ketone xylulose or you can just use an isomerase and directly do an entire conversion from xylose to xylulose. Finally, you add in a, you know, um, a, a phosphate um, molecule to it. Uh, so you have your xylulose 5-phosphate, it's charged, it's ready to you know, uh, go into the pentose phosphate pathway. Uh, so once it enters pentose phosphate pathway, it directly feeds into uh, central carbon metabolism and then you know, it goes ahead. Um, so this has been like the two ways to engineer it. And um, we actually thought we would go over with this uh, right side pathway of the isomerase pathway using a xylose isomerase and xylulose kinase for, to do our engineering. Um, but before we went ahead and started engineering, we wanted to see, okay, this is how we as humans have been engineering these, right? And also when we try to engineer this, we want to make sure these particular enzymes that we are, you know, uh, genetically, uh, uh, inserting into these organisms genome uh, is constitutively on. So they don't have any kind of regulation in there. They're always turned on. So we thought, okay, how does nature metabolize this sugar? And because yeast in itself me metabolizes uh, several uh, sugars of, on its own, and it does it very well. It is known for, you know, converting sugars into, you know, products like uh, acids and alcohols uh, quite well. So we thought, okay, let's study how nature does it, especially how does yeast do it, and can we take lessons from that and apply it towards our engineering step? Uh, so when you look at natural sugar assimilation, especially in higher eukaryotes and you know eukaryotes in general, uh, it's not a process of where you know you have these enzymes that are being turned on all the time. Uh, even let's say in 
lower order organisms like you know prokaryotes like e coli and all you still have like operons and things like that i'm pretty sure people have studied about like you know lac operon where in the presence of lactose you have your genes turned on uh, so similar to an operon but higher and larger order in scale is something called a regulon a regulon is basically where you have dynamic regulations where hundreds of genes are being regulated by a particular transcription factor um in response to some kind of a uh, sugar or any kind of uh, signal that's there in the environment um so let's say you have some kind of sugar like you know galactose glucose xylose etc um this particular sugar is being sensed by a native sensor that's there in these organisms and that in turn would turn on um the transcription factor and this transcription factor goes and binds to all the genes up um upstream regions of these genes that are needed for growth and then would turn down all the necessary pathways that are needed for you know better growth uh for making biomass for making products etc and one interesting thing that we found is that especially in yeast these regulants are you know highly uh, object oriented uh for example let's say there is a glucose regulon uh so the main purpose of glucose regulon is for completely fast uh, glucose depletion so you won't have that much biomass but you're going to have a lot of alcohol in there uh what's this on the other hand if you take galactose it has been highly tuned for actually um, you know better growth rather than forming any kind of a product uh so you can see here that these are actually not you know random genes that are being upregulated all the time they are you know specific ones so we wanted to take a look at it in detail uh and have a snap we have a snapshot here of the galactose regulon in yeast um so it basically follows the same principle as i talked about before uh whenever you have galactose in the environment uh, it is being sensed by two kinds of sensors there's a primary sensor and there's a secondary sensor uh both of these sensors um basically bind to galactose and that results in a conformational shift in this particular protein um that in turn you know um activates this uh, transcription factor called GAL4P and GAL4P is like the primary transcription factor that goes and activates all the genes that are required for growth on galactose um so we went ahead and looked at what kind of genes are these that are needed for growth on galactose can we take you know a deeper look at it um so we found that it can be uh, divided into two kinds of genes one is something what i call as the initial metabolic genes and something what we call as downstream genes uh so the initial metabolic genes are basically the lelouar pathway it's called where basically glucose is converted uh, gas or galactose is converted to a central carbon metabolism intermediate right uh, so galactose goes from galactose to galactose 1 phosphate to galactose udp uh, and then finally it goes to form uh, glucose 6 phosphate in the end um so that is basically the initial metabolic genes and then there are something called the downstream genes uh we know this because we know that when you activate gal4p a lot of genes gets down regulated sorry up regulated uh but we don't know the role of all of these genes that are there uh so then the question becomes what do the genes do how why are the genes needed to even you know uh get up regulated for growth uh so we went digging a little further and we did see as i said we did find that hundreds of genes are upregulated and when we looked at the functions of these genes we found that a lot of genes are required for cell growth mitochondrial function protein synthesis basically things that are actually needed for growth they are not you know random genes that are being upregulated and when you take a look at these particular genes that are you know up or down regulated it seems that it doesn't matter what kind of sugar you grow it in uh these genes are you know required for growth in all kinds of sugars uh so we thought okay now let's compare what uh we have with the galactose sensing system in yeast versus what we as humans have been engineering for xylose um for so the first thing that you know we quite obvious is that we don't have any kind of a sensing system with xylose versus with galactose we have this like highly precise nutrient sensing system that's there um um uh, as i said since we don't have any kind of a sensing system uh interestingly whenever people have been doing transcriptomics in it uh especially for growth in xylose they do find that you know cells actually think that they are starving 
even though it has a lot of sugar in the medium, it cannot sense that there is a particular sugar because that xylose is not in its na natural habitat. It's not found. So it starts thinking it's in a starvation mode and starts, uh, you know, uh, upregulating all the genes that are required for, uh, whenever there is, you know, the absence of sugar. So it essentially, even though it's consuming a lot of sugar for itself, uh, it goes into a starvation mode, which as you can, you know, uh, guess is not uh, ideal at all. Uh, the other thing is that galactose growth is, you know, regular and controlled. It's, you know, uh, highly specific for a particular objective, which is for growth in this case, for galactose. Uh, in xylose, we don't have uh, any of that, you know, uh, fine tuning of the pathway. Uh, we are just going to overexpress a couple of genes and then we don't have any regulation of it that at least we know of. Um, so you can think of it as some kind of, you know, um, the metabolic pathway as some kind of uh, tubes connected with walls. Um, and, you know, you have like an overhead tank, uh, which is controlled by this master regulator of Regulon. Uh, so when you have this galactose Regulon that is turned on, it kind of goes and starts turning on other valves or other transcription factors. Uh, so you end up uh, producing whatever, in this case, it's, you know, just biomass and then one particular product. It, does, it doesn't produce random things. Um, however, let's say you have your xylose metabolism that is not engineered. Then in this case, there are, there are no specific regulons and we don't know how these transcription factors are going to behave. Uh, so what you end up is having is that there's this bleeding of, you know, uh, flux through these pathways to, you know, different products and biomass. Uh, you don't get any specific one. You just get like random ones. And um, in the in engineering, you definitely don't want that. You want to, you know, push your flux or push your pathway towards one particular product or biomass that you want. Um, so we thought, you know, that kind of makes sense why we've been having so much trouble with the xylose uh, pathway for this long. Um, and as I said, the third one is basically reiterating the fact that, you know, there's regulon based dynamic control in galactose. In xylose, we don't have that. Um, okay. So that basically uh, goes directly over into the question of, you know, so what does this regulon do and how does it, you know, affect growth? Uh, so we wanted to, you know, test that out and actually show uh, that a regulon is actually very important for growth um, by using this galactose as a test case. Uh, so we have this wild type strain of yeast that has this intact regulon in it. And then <clears throat> we have this uh, galcons that we call it as a galcons, where we knocked out this uh, transcription factor called gal4p. Uh, so once it's knocked out, uh, we took these uh, Lillouard pathway genes, uh, the genes that are needed to convert um, galactose to uh, glucose 6-phosphate. Uh, which is a NATO uh, intermediate, right? Uh, and started expressing them constitutively. Uh, this is basically our own version of, you know, what would happen if galactose cannot be natively used by these uh, organisms. Um, and we are going to engineer galactose metabolism in yeast. Uh, so then at that point, we wouldn't have any transcription factor specific for galactose. So we knocked that out of the system. And then we started expressing these initial pathway genes or initial metabolic genes called Lillouard genes. Um, and we call this as the GALCON strain because it's constitutively expressed galactose metabolism. And we don't know what happens to these downstream genes in this. And we thought, okay, now let's compare growth between these two strains. And <clears throat> as you can see here, the wild type uh, strain, the GAL reg that's there, has a much higher growth, much higher growth rate than the galcon strain. Uh, the wild type strain has a growth rate that you know what we have been seen, what what we have seen in other literature too, which 0.3 per hour, completely normal. But you can see a huge lag that happens in the galcon strain, uh, which kind of um, proves our hypothesis in the first place that you know you need these downstream genes and this gal4 to be there. Uh, but then we had a question, you know, is it a difference in expression that's there in these Lillouard genes that's causing these or are there like, um, you know, things that are, you know, messed up because we started engineering with the system. Uh, so we thought, you know, let's create, um, let's put back the GAL4P in 
uh, but we'll still not have the Lillard genes under the expression of these uh, GAL4P. We'll still constitutively express these Lillard genes and have GAL4P expressed uh, so that you know it can activate all the downstream genes. Uh, so this is kind of an in-between question of you know what a wild type strain is and what a GALCONS is. We call it GALCONS GAL4. I specifically don't know why we named it like that, but thinking back, I think it's a weird name for this particular strain, but whatever. Um, um, so with that particular strain, uh, you can see that it actually uh, recovered a lot of the growth rate defects that we found in the GALCON strain, uh, just because we have GAL4P being expressed, which in turn starts expressing, you know, um, which in turn starts activating all the downstream genes. Um, so this kind of uh, confirmed our hypothesis um, that, you know, showed that the regulon controlled downstream genes do play you know, a huge role in growth. And, um, and the second thing that we actually assumed, and we also confirmed it with like transcriptomics, was that there are a lot of downstream genes that are not specific for galactose metabolism that is being upregulated whenever you have, you know, the scal 4 the transcription factor being upregulated or being turned on. Uh, so using this knowledge, now that we know that, okay, this regulons do play a huge role, can we use this knowledge and apply it for, you know, xylose metabolism? That was our second part of this. With that, okay, let's now build a synthetic xylose regulon. Because so far people have been, you know, constitutively upregulating genes for xylose metabolism. And there hasn't been any study on, you know, or very little, no study or done on, you know, um, xylose regulation. But in this case, we thought, you know, let's build xylose regulation first and then worry about metabolism second. Uh, so then that becomes a question of, you know, how do you build these xylose regulons? In an ideal case scenario, it would be a bottom up engineering where, you know, you would have um, a sensor for the xylose, which in turn would activate a regulator and all the genes for growth on xylose would be activated. Uh, but as you can guess, again, this would involve extensive engineering where you need to find a sensor, couple it to a regulator, and then start engineering all the genes for growth on silos. Um, so we quickly decided not to do this and thought, you know, let's do a top-down approach where since we already know this galactose regulon works really well, let's take this galactose regulon and repurpose it for a xylose regulon. Um, so in that case, what we have to do is um, you have to take uh, the first part, which is, you know, the sensor that's there, which is called the GAL3 or the GAL1, and uh, engineer it so that it can sense xylose instead of galactose. So that would be the first engineering step that we need to do. Second is we need to, you know, mimic this uh, signal transduction that happens with um, galactose in the case of xylose metabolism or regulation. And finally, we need to place genes that are needed for growth on um, xylose under this control of this GAL4P transcription factor that's there. Uh, <clears throat> so we thought, okay, let's start going over each of these and start engineering them. So first is to, you know, uh, make this particular sensor GAL3P respond to xylose. Uh, so for that, we have to take this protein and start mutating them uh, so that, you know, it can... <clears throat> Uh, bind to xylose. Uh, so how we did that is basically we came up with a screening and uh, uh, selection system uh, where we thought, you know, you can think of this entire system as some kind of an AND gate where you have your active GAL3 that's there and then you have your galactose or xylose. And only when both of these are there, uh, they would, you know, uh, result in either antibiotic resistance, which would be offered by this CANMX gene where we would be giving it uh, some kind of an antibiotic. Uh, and then we would have um, green fluorescence being um, up green fluorescence being upregulated, um, which we'd be basically seeing it as fluorescence, which can be measured and quantified. So we built this, you know, uh, screening and selection system that's there. Uh, and since we have antibiotics, it can be easily selected for in a plate that has antibiotic, uh, which is CANMX or G418. And then uh, we can measure what the fluorescence is to get a quantitative output. Uh, so what would happen is as a control, we can, you know, give galactose, see what is the antibiotic selection, see what is the fluorescent readout. 
to whatever mutation we want with GAL3 protein and then give it xylose and see is there antibiotic selection, is there fluorescence readout. Uh, so that way we can keep track of, you know, is it working well in galactose? And can we start seeing, because of these mutations, is xylose binding to GAL3? And is that causing some kind of an antibiotic selection or a fluorescent readout? Uh, so that was basically our entire selection screening system. Uh, I'm not going to go over all of them, but we kind of screened like half a million mutants. And finally, we did get what we wanted. We did four rounds of different kinds of uh, mutations in it. Uh, we did something called an interaction loop mutagenesis. I can go over that later after the talk, because you might be running over time. Um, and then we did uh, site saturation mutagenesis. Finally, we thought, you know, let's start mutating them randomly. Uh, and then we got took all those different kinds of mutations we had and started shuffling them using a technique called synthetic shuffling. And finally, we ended up with this final mutant, which, which we call as GAL3 syn 4.1. Um, and you, as you can see here, the wild type does not bind to silos well. Uh, it has a really low preference or really low fold change at 2% silos, which is nothing but fluorescence of uh, <clears throat> that is observed with and without silos. And the final mutant has, you know, a uh, 15 fold higher uh, this fold change uh, than what we saw in the wild type GAL3. <clears throat> and that's basically the raw fluorescence value that I'm showing over here. As you can see, the GAL3 and 4.1 work uh, as we wanted. So we were happy with that. So we thought, okay, uh, with four rounds of direct evolution, right now we have a good higher interaction strength of you know this particular GAL3 protein with xylos. Let's go ahead and start the next step. It's basically we want to mimic this uh, signal transcription that happens with galactose in xylos. Uh, <clears throat> so I know I've shown this figure a couple of times, a couple of times, but what essentially happens here? is that there are different feedback loops, like interconnecting feedback loops in this regulation, right? As you can see, there are like negative, feed lab, negative feedback loop by GAL80 towards GAL4. And then there are two positive feedback loops, one created by this GAL3 protein and one created by this GAL1 protein. Um, so the difference between GAL1 and GAL3 is that GAL3 is expressed uh, at a higher basal level, even when galactose is not present, versus uh, this low um, GAL1 is like a, it's, it's actually under a strict tighter control than GAL3. Um, and people have done a lot of simulations on this. And what they came to find out is that the reason why we have two different kinds of sensors is so that this kind of a dual feedback loop uh, results in increased sensitivity first. And then it also lowers noise. Uh, so this, um, so we wanted to engineer a system that basically has the same function. You know, you wanted to increase sensitivity and lowers uh, transcriptional noise in the system. Uh, so to do that, then we have to engineer GAL1 next. Uh, the issue with GAL1 is that GAL1 is also acts as a, it's actually an enzyme that moonlights as a transcription factor or transcriptional binding sensor. Uh, <clears throat> then in that case, uh, trying to engineer GAL1 is not a good idea because it's also an enzyme which is going to bind to galactose and converts it to galactose 1-phosphate. The issue with this particular enzyme is that galactose 1-phosphate, the metabolite itself, is a toxic metabolite when it accumulates to a higher uh, amount. Uh, so you would expect that if it in case starts cross-reacting with xylose, you might end up having xylose 1-phosphate there, uh, which is which would be toxic for the cell. So we didn't want to play around with that. We didn't want to even like engineer this galactose on phosphate. But um, we kind of assumed that, you know, since uh, we know what the role of galactose one phosphate is, and it seems the main uh, reason why it works the way it works is because it has this low basal expression uh, when galactose is not there, or it has a tight control. And then when you provide uh, galactose, it has a higher expression. And that is what is uh, you know, needed for this low noise uh, system that's there when galactose is present. Um, so our idea is that let's keep galactose, uh, let's keep GAL1P as it is, not touch it. 
uh, but we'll take the SCAL3 protein and uh, express it in the same way. Uh, so instead of having one GAL3 protein, we'd have two different GAL3 proteins. This is basically what I talked about. Sorry, I forgot to skip a slide. Um, <coughs> Uh, so instead of, we thought that you know we would have um, two different versions of this uh, xylostragalon. One is something called a single feedback xylostragalon, where we would completely remove this galactose one phosphate that's there. Um, <clears throat> and second is we would have a dual feedback of this um, xylostragalon, where we would have the same GAL3 p mutant being expressed uh, the same way as how GAL3 is expressed and also how GAL1 is expressed. Um, <clears throat> so emulating that kind of, uh, you know, the feedback regulation of a galactose regulon would give us increased sensitivity and also minimize noise. Um, so we tried doing that. Uh, so we came up with this dual feedback system and then we look for sensitivity. So basically I'm giving, uh, so it's the same selection system or screening system that I talked about before, where you know increasing concentrations of xylose is given and fluorescence is being being you know checked, and you can see the dual feedback loop has higher fluorescence than you know uh, single feedback for the same concentration of xylose that's used. We are happy with that. Then we wanted to see you know does it also stabilize the expression. Uh, so we wanted to look at, you know, what is the coefficient of variation when this thing is being, when a different concentration of xylose uh, for the same fluorescence. And again, you can see here that there's a consistent decrease in, um, you know, uh, coefficient of variation in a dual feedback loop than a single feedback loop. What it basically says is that, you know, if you have a dual feedback loop, uh, it's going to have a more stable expression than when you have a single feedback loop. Uh, so again, it seems clear that, you know, as long as you have, especially in, in like low concentrations of xylose, there's like a very stable expression. So we are happy with that too. And that leaves us with the final step. We want to actually engineer metabolism now. Uh, <clears throat> so we thought, you know, let's create a xylose regulon strain where you would have xylose activated, um, which would be sensed by this gal in 4.1 which would in turn activate GAL4P and you would have, which GAL4P would then go and bind to genes that are responsible for xylose metabolism and turn it on, uh, which the strain, we call it as a xylotrex strain. But then we wanted to see, you know, okay, so now we have this struggle on strain that's gonna, you know, hopefully performs better, but then we need to, something to compare it with. So we thought, you know, let's build this xyl constraint, which is, you know, which, which is basically a strain that doesn't have downstream genes but has all the meta uh, xylose metabolic genes been constitutively overexpressed. And we thought, you know, let's compare it and see which one performs better. And there's no surprise here, as we expected, as we saw in the case of galactose, the xylose, uh, the xylrex strain or the xylose regulon strain performed much better than the xylcon strain that we saw. Uh, so we were all like, you know, really happy, we like, yes, finally we got what we wanted. Uh, but, you know, as a scientist, you are, as a, student of science, you keep wondering, you know, yes, you did all this, but what is it that is actually making it grow better? We want to, you know, dig into it further. Uh, so that's the next section of the talk. Uh, but just to go over what the summary of this section is that uh, we kind of confirmed without doubt that a uh, regulon is needed for growth. Um, so we thought, you know, let's engineer a synthetic regulon in this case. and. To do that, we had to do some protein engineering, metabolic engineering, some regulatory pathway engineering. Um, <clears throat> finally, we obtained this xylrex strain that seems to be growing much better than xylcon strain. And coincidentally, we found that that is the fastest growing rationally engineered xylo strain that we had. Uh, we were happy with that. Uh, then we wanted to know, as I said, you know, why do these strains grow faster? Uh, so we thought, you know, let's take all the regulon strains that we have and all the constitutive strains that we have and, you know, put them against each other and do like an RNA-seq analysis or transcriptomics analysis. Um, so here I'm just having a table of, you know, uh, growth of different, uh, of all the strains that we have, how they are grown, what is the regulation involved in it, and just a comparison of their growth rates. So we took all these strains, uh, performed RNA-seq on it, uh, just to go over what RNA-seq is, um, is RNA-seq is basically um, looking at the RNA 
as a substitute for looking at protein. And the idea is that the different levels of RNA would give an estimate of how much the genes are being up or down regulated. Um, so this is basically just a crude um, heat map of all the genes that we have you know, sequenced and compared. There were like around 5,200 genes that were analyzed. Uh, we thought, you know, we'll take like a little bit of systematic approach. Here we thought we would, uh, you know, find out differentially expressed genes. Uh, we would see what are the genes that are upregulated in these red strains and what are the genes that are upregulated in these corn strains, and then group them based on function. And then finally ask the question, okay, now that we have all these data with, the, with us, does it actually mean anything? Um, so we found that around 450 genes were upregulated in the regulon strains, and around 500 genes were upregulated in the, you know, those corn strains, which is a way of saying 500 genes were downregulated in the regulon strains. So then we took all these genes and started grouping them based on functionality. And we found that all these genes that are upregulated are actually growth-related genes. They are needed for growth. No surprise there, I guess. What we also found that, is, that we thought is quite interesting is that a lot of these genes that are response for stimulus-based genes are actually stress-response-related genes. Uh, and some of them are also you know, starvation-response uh, genes, which I think I initially mentioned much earlier that you know that is a phenomena that seems to happen whenever there's no regulation involved in growth. Um, so the same thing is here where these constraints are thinking that they're actually starving because you don't have any sensing system for these sugars. Uh, then, so once we did all this, it seemed it is clear why we see an upregulation of growth or increased growth in regulon strains. But then we wanted to know are we seeing these increase in growth regulated genes because they are you know growing better or we are it's growing better and that is what is causing growth related genes it's basically a question of you know are we is the, is the growth related genes increase in upregulation we seeing is it a cause or a you know an actual effect of increased growth uh, to do that there are two things to do one you can look at metabolomics uh, which at that time our lab was not you know equipped to do but we can also look at you know uh, growth related transcription factors and see whether they are on or not. Uh, so that we thought you know that is a potentially easier way to you know track it down. Um, so we started looking at all the transcription factors that are there, and <clears throat> I'm just skipping a little forward here. And so there are a total of uh, 184 regulated transcription factors in East out of which we found that almost 39 were upregulated in either the reg or corn strains. So we took these 39 transcription factors and analyzing what they do. And the same um, pattern emerged basically where uh, some of these transcription factors upregulate up -regulate in the corn strains are responsible for stress and nutrient starvation. And then the ones that are upregulated in the reg strains are responsible for growth. Um, <clears throat> So just to summarize whatever I spoke over here, uh, transcriptomics basically gave us more conclusive evidence and showed that, you know, uh, whatever the absorbed phenotype is there is because of uh, regulons and that <clears throat> when we do this differential gene expression and transcription factor analysis, it seems clear that REC strains have a lot of growth-related genes that are being upregulated. Uh, specifically, we found that a lot of, you know, cellular and mitochondrial biogenesis pathways to be upregulated. And that is possibly what is being translated as, you know, better growth in these strains. Um, <clears throat> how are we doing on time? Okay, we have like 12 minutes. I'm going to quickly uh, go over something that, you know, we did as an afterthought, which is basically, you know, trying to expand this regular engineering that we developed. <clears throat> um, so the idea is that um, this arabinose metabolism, right? It's an other sugar, um, uh, second most abundant pentoses that are there in lignocellulose. And there has been less research done on this than even, you know, xylose. So we thought, you know, can we <clears throat> do the exact same thing we did in the case of xylose and see a better, see better growth? Uh, <clears throat> so we basically have the same thing. We have an arabinose regulon. Uh, 
we decide, you know, in order to create an Arabinos regulon, we have to engineer GAL3P to sense Arabinos and then emulate all the signal based transactions that's there in the case of Galactose regulon. And finally, place Arabinos metabolic genes under the Galactose regulon that's there. Um, so, in our case, we already have studied this, you know, GAL based signal transaction. We know what needs to be done. Uh, so we basically don't have to do that. We can skip that part. So now we have only like two things we need to do. And without going into, you know, how we did, because it was exactly the same uh, things that we did with the case of uh, Xylos. We did the same procedure. We did a lot of different kinds of mutations here. We got a mutant, GAL3P mutant, that binds to Arabinos better than the wild type. Uh, we thought it was good enough. We can go ahead with, you know, <clears throat> engineering them, uh, then we placed all the necessary genes that are needed for arabinose growth in this Regulon strain, which we call Arareg here. And to compare it, we also placed, you know, uh, constitutive uh, expression strain, which we call as Aracons. Then we compared their growth. And we see the same pattern here that, you know, in the case of Regulon strain, we have much better growth um, than the constitutive strain. Um, so this is the point, I think, when I started, you know, uh, we didn't want to do any more RNA sequences because we wanted more data and do more engineering on the Regulon strain before going into the, you know, before deep diving essentially into the RNA seq of this. Um, but one thing that kept bothering me with this is that there was this extensive need to, you know, engineer this GAL3P sensor protein. Uh, every time we had to engineer, we had to do like three or four rounds of engineering, but took a few months, essentially, um, which you can think that, um, let's say, um, you know, you want to do a catabolic engineering on new sugar, you don't want to go into the SCAL3P and start mutating, mutating it every time you want to engineer one. Um, so we thought, you know, can we change it a little bit so that there's no need for this SCAL3P engineering every time we want to engineer a new sugar for yeast? Uh, so we started deep diving to how this GAL3P works. Uh, so GAL3P works basically by two different regulations, regulation mechanism. One is this carbon catabolite repression that is done by glucose. And also you have activation by the xylose, galactose, or arabinose, depending on what uh, version of GAL3 you have. Uh, so there's basically, because of all the, you know, limitations we have in mutating them, we thought can be skip over all this and do something better. Uh, so we thought, let's create a mutant of GAL3 that doesn't need a sugar to activate it. Uh, or in other words, it will be like always turned on. It will be a constitutive GAL3 version. Uh, and the good thing is that even though it's self-activating or it's constitutive all the time, that it gets turned on even in the, even in the absence of sugar, we have glucose which can repress expression of this GAL3 and place it under strict tight control whenever we, you know, don't want this to be turned on. Um, so this was not so hard to do because we we can easily find constitutive mutants whenever we start doing mutations. Uh, <clears throat> so we were able to like, you know, quickly characterize a couple of mutants, uh, which we call here as GAL3 5.1. And basically we see here that even whatever the sugar is, uh, you can see an upregulation of fluorescence uh, when compared to the wild type strain that we have. And interestingly, you see that in the case of galactose, it's almost the same, but in the case of other sugars, it differs. And I'm not going over it in detail here because, you know, I think I'm almost out of time. Uh, but yeah, you do see a similar observe, uh, phenomena here where there's increased growth of both xylose and arabinose with the self-activating mutants that we created. Um, um, so I think that's all I prepared for this talk. Um, so this particular section, basically we went on and did like two different extension of this regular engineering approach. And interestingly, and even surprisingly, we found that both of them were successful. Um, and we also kind of, you know, shrunk this regular engineering, which is a three-step approach into like one step. So that it can be like easy to do for who, who wants to do catabolic engineering in yeast in the future. Um, so with that, I think, oh yeah, maybe I can just quickly go over what 
uh, thing that we need to go over is. Uh, so we kind of we were the first ones to introduce this new technique called Regulon engineering for carbon or catabolic engineering, mostly for carbons, carbon sugars. Um, we showed that you know regulons are needed for growth and using this regular engineering approach we can increase um, growth rate in any non-native carbon source that we want um, with that i would like to take any questions and thank you all for your patience and listening to me um, i yeah so uh, yes, yeah, so thank you, sir. Thank you for an informative presentation on Regulon engineering and uh, how Regulons play a major role in the growth. Uh, we have a few questions here, sir. Uh, the first one is, if the HMP pathway is blocked by the Regulons by knocking out the regulator gene, is it still possible to express the transcription factors related to the regulatory enzyme of that pathway? But you can always, um, you know, do constitute overexpression or other kinds of things to get over the native regulation that's there. Uh, the one thing that's good with synthetic biology and, you know, model organisms like E. coli and, you know, uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae is that we have a host of um, well-paneled constitutive promoters that we can use. Um, so you can quickly take one of those, couple it to a transcript, sorry, transcription factor that, you know, you want to be overruled by whatever native regulation that's there and do it. Uh, I don't think it is a huge issue, yeah. I think we can still get over that. Um, okay, so, and the next question is, uh, is knockout the only process to confirm the role or significance of any Regulon gene? If there is any, can you comment on them? Mm, knockout is one clean way to do it, right? Like, uh, because when you knock it out, you don't have to worry, you know, is there anything remaining, anything? Uh, another way to do it would be to, you know, um, grow these in a in a panel of different sugars that the idea would be that you know um, regulons are core genes that are you know, needed and is controlled by different kinds of regulons um, um, so when you grow them in a panel of sugars you would see some kind of a core gene that is still being upregulated in all of them um, but then you would have to control with some kind of a basal level um, base level for that particular cell, right, or E strain, uh, which doesn't have um, growth or metabolism happening in that. Uh, we've actually thought a lot about this particular question, and we, I don't think we still have any good solution to that, but I think, yeah, knockout is probably like the cleanest way to do it, and the easiest, yeah. Um, okay, so the next question is, positive or negative feedback loop, which gives better results? Uh, they both have like very different functions, um, right? Like a negative feedback loop is something that, you know, uh, you, you're making more of a product, let's say, and it's might be toxic. Uh, so you signal the cell saying, you know, you know, stop making this right now because you have more of this being formed. And how this usually happens is that the product is what acts as an inhibitor for that particular transcription or the process itself. Uh, so that's what a negative feedback loop is, right? But a positive feedback loop is completely opposite, where let's say you are consuming a sugar, then once you detect that there's this particular sugar in the environment, then you want to consume more and more of it. You want to consume that as fast as possible. Uh, so what you do is you start cranking up all the, you know, uh, transcription and regulation that's there so that a lot of these genes are, sorry, a lot of these, uh, more of these enzymes are being formed so that you have increased, um, you know, flux to through your metabolic pathway that's needed for growth or for consumption of that particular sugar. So you have a feedback loop that is positive in nature. The more you have that particular sugar, the more um, regulation or more positive feedback that happens here. That's what a positive feedback loop is. So I'm sorry I didn't you know, explain that further. So they're kind of different functions. One is used to downplay something. One is used to you know, upregulate something. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So uh, the next question is, uh, will the system affect only in yeast or is there any other better system? Uh, there are no like, you know, the ideal best system that's there, right? Whatever organism you work with, you 
basically want to study what is the inherent regulation that's there. And then whenever you want to engineer something, we, we typically tend to inspire or get inspired by nature to do all of our engineering, right? Like whenever someone wanted to build an aeroplane, they thought, oh, look at these birds, how they are flying. Let's try to engineer something like this. Um, so, but interestingly, in the field of biological engineering, where we expect most of us to be inspired more by biology, that hasn't happened yet. Uh, so this is our, you know, um, our try at, you know, making that happen. Um, I think that's all. Apart from that, I don't think there's any specific way to do it, or this is not like the best way to do it. In every strain, every organism that we use, I think we have to study the inherent engineering that's the engineer, inherent, you know, uh, regulation that's there and try to engineer it based on that. Um, okay, so thank you, sir. The next question is, will dual feedback loop in Gal Regulon suppress cellular functions? Uh, no, that is something that's there natively, as I said, right? Like that is how galactose is metabolized. Um, it's something that's normally there. Uh, interestingly, dual feedback loop is something that's found in nature a lot. Um, because the, let's say when you, whenever there is a sugar in the environment, right? You want to make sure as soon as there's even a little bit of the sugar, the cell needs to, you know, completely, you know, metabolize it as soon as possible but in the case that there's a lot of the sugar then you need to you know increase your response as to a required level uh, so that is why there are two aspects to it there is you know the need for fast um, expression of these genes but also in case there is a lot of this there is a need for sustained and increased expression uh, that is why you have these two different feedback loops that kind of synergize with each other and you know, work together to do that, to make that happen. Um, it's actually found, I can't, I can't think on the top of my head what is used for, but it's this kind of dual feedback loop is found in our cells a lot. Uh, I think mitosis and things like that are also, can, you know, regulated by these dual feedback loops. Um, yeah, so it's quite common. And I don't think it has any cellular suppression function. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, the next question is, was there any catabolite repression mechanism? Yes, definitely. So uh, whenever you're working with uh, microbial organisms, there is definitely catabolite repression, uh, especially carbon catabolite repression or CCR by glucose is something that's found. Like you, there's no way to get over it. Uh, we tried to, you know, uh, there was a different project that we were working with where we were trying to, you know, remove this carbon catabolite repression from of, by glucose. It's so hard to do that. Like there are like interconnecting levels of regulation that's there between them. Uh, like there are at least like three different independent regulatory metabolism, um, independent regulatory mechanisms for glucose-based uh, control. Uh, you can't get over that. You just have to work with it. Or maybe we'll find a way, you know, once you have this complex system mapped out and start tinkering with, you know, where you need to hit it to remove it. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, the next question is, can regulons from organisms which can metabolize dilose be engineered into organisms that cannot metabolize? Yes. So uh, that is something that we have thought of. It's a very good question, actually. Uh, but the issue is that um, whenever you take a regulon from a different organism, right? Um, so a regulon basically has several functions, several ways in which it operates, right? One is it has to, the sensor has to detect this sugar, which we can easily move it to another organism. Yes, that is probably what the person who asked the question is talking about. Um, but then there's a second aspect to it. Uh, this particular regulon has to upregulate a transcription factor which we can also move into this heterologous organism that needs to metabolize xylose. But then the transcription factor works by binding to some kind of, you know, um, binding sequence that is there upstream of genes that are need, needed to be, you know, controlled. This binding sequence would be unique for that particular organism. Uh, you might have some kind of a conservation, but it is quite unlikely that you would find, you know, hundreds of genes having the same binding sequence in front of them for, especially for a sugar that it doesn't even, you know, 
found in its natural habitat. Uh, so I think that is the problem there where you can get like regulation in the, you can have transcriptional activation in the presence of xylose, but it would not translate to, you know, uh, transcriptional activation in all the genes that are needed for growth in xylose. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you, sir. The next question is, can metabolic xylose be tuned through Regulon? Um, what I don't, can the, who asked the question, can they explain what metabolic xylose is? I don't know what metabolic xylose, what they refer to that as. I'm guessing they're going to type. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. I don't know what metabolic xylose is. I don't know. I don't. I can't understand that question. Like, okay, so we'll answer the next. Uh, we'll go to the next question till they type the uh, question properly. Uh, okay. What are the computational biology softwares are available to know the metabolic pathway of yeast, mainly in Saccharomyces cerevisiae? Computational biology path. I don't think there are any computational biology softwares. You just go read a lot of papers and. I think review papers are a good starting point, right? Uh, um, I think, yeah, I think review papers, there are a lot of review papers on galactose, glucose, regulation in yeast, or even any particular organism, right? Uh, that's a good starting point. And then you start piecing, piecing together by reading other literature sources, you know, uh, where they go one particular regulation or one aspect of that regulation, you start piecing them together and then make a big overview out of that. I'm sorry, I think it would be really great if we had a computational tool for that. Uh, that's a good idea. Maybe whoever, question, whoever asked that question can build one if they have the expertise. I would be all into that. Uh, yes, I think we're done with the questions. The other mm -hmm. person didn't type yet and we're running out of time. So thank you, sir. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd, I'd now like to call upon um, our professor and advisor for this conference, uh, Dr. Renuka Vishwanathan, to deliver the vote of thanks. Yeah, very warm evening to all attending this conference. Uh, it's a privilege to propose the vote of thanks on this occasion. A virtual international conference uh, on global research trends in biotechnology. Uh, first and foremost, I wish to express my gratitude to our management. Thank you to the College of Engineering, thank you to a group of institutions, our chairman, Dr. B. Babu Manohan, managing director, Ms. Kusipriya, director, Mr. Sateen Shekhar, for their unstinted support and encouragement on the online conference. I also wish to thank our principal, Dr. B. Sateen and Dean, Dr. M. Patata Vardhani, for their inspiration. I wish to thank our department security, Dr. B. Kumar for his moral support, guidance, and instruction. I wish to express my thanks to the organizers, Dr. M. Samundeshwari and Ms. Preeti, for their efforts and planning in conducting this conference. I wish to thank the speaker of the afternoon session, Dr. Venkatesh, for giving an informative presentation on engineering semi-synthetic regulons. I wish to express my thanks to other speakers. Dr. Mustafa Muhammad Issa for his thoughtful presentation on the food for thought. Dr. Jovian John for sharing his research presentation on enhancing the potency of viral vaccines. And Dr. Subhuna Perumal for her informative speech on nano composite delivery system for cancer therapy. And also thanks to Dr. Narendran Shekhar for sharing her research experience and findings uh, related to and Mr. Sampath Kumar for his presentation on Arayan Hydrocarbon Infrastructure. I wish to convey my heartfelt thanks to the team of students for their dedicated education. Lastly, I wish to thank all participants from various places for their active participation. Thank you. Thank you one and all. Uh, thank you, ma'am. And I, once again, thank you, sir, for taking your time. Uh, we'll now wind up with the session. I once again thank you all for, your, for attending this conference. Uh, hope to see you all in future events conducted by our department. Uh, thank you and stay safe, all of you. Uh, thank That's you so much again.